Good afternoon and welcome to uh, uh, episode nine, then chapter nine uh, in this series of, uh, uh, of videos about the history of the BBC uh, between 1922 and 1995. And uh, we're just about to move on to the post-war period. Um, for, so after, after 19, 1945. Uh, and now towards the end of the war, it was fairly clear that uh, victory was in sight. Um, and uh, the, the whole country and certainly the government were organizing as to what to do next. Uh, uh, and one of the one of the things that's very clear is that uh, uh, many promises have been made during the war, uh, and there was going to have to be very significant social reform after the war. And indeed, this is often what we uh, consider to be the establishment of the welfare state. Uh, on the side of the BBC, the uh, appointment in 1944 of the new government, Governor General William Haley uh, marked this moment. Now, uh, uh, a series of the videos that I did uh, uh, a few months ago uh, at the beginning of the series were directly on the, who, who were the different director generals and what were their different uh, uh, contributions. So I'm not going to go into detail about William Haley. Uh, he was uh, he remained a Governor General for eight years, 1944 to 1950. It's obviously a very, very important moment, uh, not least uh, uh, in that this is the moment when television begins to become uh, important, although radio will remain more important than television for uh, quite some time, for certainly for the whole of the, uh, whole of the uh, 1950s. William Haley was previously director of The Guardian, and uh, when he resigned, uh, or sorry, when he retired from the BBC, uh, he became the editor of The Times. So you can see uh, the importance of the current affairs <coughs> side of the BBC's activity. So although current affairs may have not appeared to be the most important uh, part of the BBC uh, from the point of view of the audience, who uh, what might have been more interested in the, 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 the music and the schools programmes and many, many other things, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, this Director General and others, as, as, as we have seen, do come from the world of current affairs and, and, and uh, journalism. In, in any case, the end of the Second World War in Europe uh, was uh, celebrated by uh, dancing in the streets, as you can see there on the on the bottom left. Although, of course, it was uh, sometimes difficult to rejoice if you had lost uh, many people yourself uh, in the uh, in the war. Um, the in August, the uh, United States dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, uh, and that. Uh, Showed perhaps the uh, the beginnings of the of one of the things that that, that we would have to worry about in the next period, uh, and that was the uh, the nuclear uh, arms race. Uh, the uh, concentration camps and the death camps were um, uh, were were discovered. Uh, although you know, many people knew knew what was going on there, but the the full horror uh, of the Nazi death camps was was discovered, as you can see with the picture there. Uh, and uh, I've represented there the uh, beginnings of the welfare state. By, by, by this uh, this uh, poster of the family allowances. In, in any case, the the post-war period, which we call in English the post-war boom, uh, and which you have this wonderful expression for in French, les trente glorieuses, uh, uh, really is going to be very surprising because uh, many, many commentators assume that because there was a severe economic crisis before the Second World War, that, that this would very quickly come back again after the Second World War. Uh, this was not the case. In fact, uh, we uh, were faced with the longest boom uh, in the history uh, of um, capitalism uh, for almost uh, almost uh, 30 years. Um, in the, on the 29th of uh, July, uh, one, of the, one very important uh, symbolic change uh, in, in the BBC uh, came about uh, with the opening of the, the light programme. That is to say that the pre-war uh, radio, uh, the structure of BBC radio pre-war uh, was completely changed around and it will be changed around again in 1967. We will come to that. Uh, before the war, uh, there had really been one kind of programme Programming. There was the national programming and the regional programming, but the, the philosophy was fairly, fairly similar. Uh, and during the war, as we saw last time, the uh, demand for uh, the increased importance of ordinary people, since it was ordinary people who were going to win the war, imposed a more popular form of programming, in particularly in the forces programs. Uh, that is that the, the, the British soldiers, listening very much to BBC radio, were not 
prepared to put up with the BBC saying, now we're going to play you some opera because it's good for you, uh, that the atmosphere is, well, we're risking our lives, so play us what we want. Um, and uh, this Forces programme, the BBC Forces programme, that, that, that particular channel, during the war was even more uh, popular uh, among um, civilians than it was uh, uh, among so soldiers. Uh, and so as the war came to an end, there was an obvious demand and, uh, and indeed need to change around um, the way that uh, the uh, structuring of the BBC radio programmes was, uh, was, uh, was conceived. Uh, and the new plan was to have a home service, a light programme and a third programme. Let's say three radio channels. This seemed a great riches um, at the time. Uh, now, the names of the programmes uh, are fairly, give a fairly clear attitude, I may have already mentioned this, the light programme. It's not exactly horribly negative, uh, but it's certainly rather dismissive. I mean, th there was no question of calling uh, the programme full of uh, theatre and opera the heavy programme, as many people probably considered it to be. Uh, so there was the, the, the light programme, which was going to um, include a, a large amount of, uh, um, of uh, music, uh, of popular music. But also such programmes as the Woman's as Woman's Hour, we will come back to this, it was interesting to see that Woman's Hour should be put on the light programme, as if uh, things that women are interested in uh, necessarily light. Uh, the Home Service then and the third programme, the Home Service was somewhere in the middle, uh, and the third programme uh, was the more intellectual, uh, high culture uh, uh, programme. Uh, no, I'm on the wrong, uh, yes, I'm on the wrong... Uh, Thing there. So the, the third program would concentrate on high culture. The light program, as a BBC internal memorandum the previous year had put it, hoped to be, and I quote, a popular but not rubbishy program for the masses, designed to be effective in, competi in competition with neighbouring sponsored stations. So they're very clear that, that they are producing the light program as competition to Radio Normandy, Radio Luxembourg and so on. Huh? Uh, so that very, very much that very much in, much in mind. Uh, I have put uh, somewhere on uh, on on uh, on my blog a uh, this uh, a link to uh, this uh, documentary about the light program, which is uh, which is tre tremendously uh, in, uh, interesting. So moving on then 1945 to 1995 this is the period that I, i'm introducing now which will probably go in for three videos or perhaps even more but i hope to get through it in three videos um this could certainly be uh, presented uh, as the golden age of terrestrial uh, television and the beginning uh, of this period um the bbc had a monopolistic position no other body was permitted to broadcast uh, and the monopoly lasted until 1954 in television and 1973 uh, in radio. Uh, after that, after 1954 in television, 1973 in radio, the BBC had to adapt to the presence of commercial alternatives and also had to adapt to the rise of neoliberalism in government and its more restrictive view of what public spending should cover in the social and educational fields. Uh, and finally, in the last few years, in the, in the 80s and 90s, the competition from cable and satellite television, pay-per-view, and such phenomena grew quickly. Uh, and 1995, the very end of our period, is the first year that the corporation proposed content on the internet. So let's go back to our chronology here uh, and what, 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 what was going on then uh, in 1945, 1946, 1947. Uh, I'm going to go through, through this year by year, giving you two or three um, key uh, episodes or themes, which I'm hoping you will know now how to link in with the big themes, the BBC and modernity, the BBC and diversity, the BBC and whatever you consider to be the most important themes. Uh, well, something uh, rather um, significant happened uh, in uh, 1946. Uh, but first of all, uh, before I come to this, uh, first of all, on the television, we saw the first ever uh, full-length te television drama, which was the, the Silence of the Sea, based on a French, French novel uh, and film about the resistance to Nazi occupation. Uh, 
uh, and uh, created in 1946 for the radio on the BBC's light program. Notice the symbolism of that. Uh, you had the uh, invention of the program Woman's Hour, uh, and this uh, book that you can see in front of you uh, was uh, uh, written to celebrate 60 years of Woman's Hour, and you can see uh, that it's entitled Celebrating 60 Years of Women's Lives, and the forward is by one of the Women's Hour presenters from later uh, decades. Uh, the word celebrating is very interesting here because uh, this is one of the things which is at stake. That is to say, if you say, all right, uh, every morning uh, we're going to have an hour about women's lives and women's interests, then this is a recognition of the importance uh, of the people, just as uh, when uh, the BBC television will begin uh, presenting um, television programs specifically aimed at Pakistanis living in Britain, this is a recognition of their importance. Yeah, so so the, the establishment of, of, of Women's Hour uh, is a part of the increasing recognition of the uh, importance of women in, in, the, in the public space. It was first broadcast on the uh, 7th of October 1946, originally presented by Alan Ivamy. So the first programs were not presented by women but by men. Uh, and uh, and uh, that the, 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 the was Women's Hour. I, I have one example, in fact. Uh, if you uh, if you go to the uh, BBC Genome uh, on sites uh, on on the on the internet, uh, and I, I'm going to mention this in, the, in a future video, uh, you can find the listings what was on the radio or the television for the whole period. Now, of course, it's it's massively too long to read, uh, but if you uh, hear about a particular program, like in this case, Woman's Hour, you go and you search for Woman's Hour, and you can look at two or three examples of what they actually produced, which is very good because it's always better to have. A specific example. So I've just chosen one from 1955, and you can see uh, that on this day uh, we have a whole series of things included in Women's Hour. Uh, the uh, uh, a, a description of the work of loading bananas by women in a Jamaican port. So you can see some interest in uh, women from other parts of the world, and hard-working women from other parts of the world. Uh, uh, and at the same time, yes, woman as a social queen. Margaret Calhoun looks at an encyclopedia of etiquette. There we're thinking very much of something that would be interesting, mostly interesting to bourgeois women rather than to working class women. Uh, they also have some romance in there, uh, some, something about Agatha Christie, uh, and so on and, and so on and so forth. So you have a huge amount uh, uh, of content. This is just a, a day which I've uh, taken uh, at random, but it gives you some sort of idea. It also, I think, you know, you've got, you, you, you remember there's still a lot of people uh, at this time who remember what it was like not to have a radio uh, and uh, um, housewer, housewives or uh, shop, uh, shop assistants in, small, in some smaller shops uh, uh, would be very excited to be able to listen to this uh, rather than just uh, have the conversation with the neighbours because there was uh, uh, and 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 uh, maybe new, perhaps newspapers to read and so on. So it was a really a real enrichment of uh, of 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 people's of people's lives. So I'll come back to this question because uh, quite understandably you know, nobody talks about trains which arrive on time. So we uh, often talk about the media in order to complain about them, and this is very human. Nevertheless, I think that the uh, the principal aspect of the uh, media in the 20th century is a tremendous enchantment of uh, everyday life. And uh, if very rac rapidly 70, 80, 90 percent of the population got radios and then later televisions, they knew why they were doing it. And that was that it was going to bring uh, uh, a tremendous amount of variety uh, and interest into, in, in, uh, into, into their lives. Uh, uh, in September 1940, uh, 1946, sorry, the third programme begins broadcasting on radio. So uh, I, I mentioned that there's this new separation, the light programme, the home service and the, uh, the third programme. Uh, there's this separation, but it, in fact, this was all introduced over a period of, uh, of uh, rather more than a year. And so the third programme is finally uh, established then uh, in uh, in uh, in September, uh, in that's in September 1946. I'm pretty sure. Yes, um, the third program, as I was saying, very much about theatre and about uh, uh, talks on uh, talks on serious serious subjects, political debates, opera, uh, classical music. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. And it, it's an interesting phenomenon because it lasts for uh, a whole period. 
even though it attracts a very small percentage of listeners uh, from an economic point of view the third program was uh, would never have survived could absolutely not have survived as a commercial radio because they continually put forward content which is fundamentally not very popular Um, and it's interesting, and, it, and in many ways, the, the whole program or the whole project of the third program was a new format of educating the masses. But in this case, more in line with uh, with the uh, Labour government of 1945 to 51, where the idea of improving the lives of everybody, free doctors, free hospitals, uh, and yeah, opera and classical music for everybody, seemed to be part of that. Uh, in uh, the the last night of the proms, were, in fact, the promenade concerts was revived uh, by the BBC uh, after the war. Of course, there had been an interruption during the war. There's a series of uh, classical music concerts, quite often concentrating perhaps on the the more popular of classical music, Beethoven, uh, uh, Bach, and so on. And in particular, developing slowly this. Uh, rather special event which is the last night of the proms which is still very um, very present today uh, in british public life uh, and what happens at the last night of the proms is that traditionally they play a whole series of patriotic pieces uh, and the promenade concerts the proms are many many concerts and there are dozens of concerts every year uh, and the last night uh, is a time when there is far more audience participation everybody sings along which is as you know is normally forbidden uh, in high culture classical concerts uh if you go to see beethoven's ninth uh, symphony don't sing along people will not like it um uh and uh, indeed not only did the audience uh, participate and make a lot of noise um there's also a tradition of, of singing uh, raucously uh, nationalist songs like you know land of hope and glory i don't know if you know the words of land of hope and glory but it's very much an old-fashioned empire song you know uh, um Wider, wider still and wider, may thy bounds be set. God, who made thee mighty, make thee mightier yet. So it's a, a song wishing that the British Empire will get bigger every year. And this is still sung in 2000, 2021. Um, so there's something now, there's a sort of, there's an element of British humour and irony uh, in all that. And there's an element of... Uh, patriotism and there's an element of nationalism it's quite a difficult mix to uh, understand but this was something which has has been developed mostly after uh, the second world war and at the, at the beginning when um, when all this audience participation and singing along came in some people th some people were very critical and they said uh, uh, they said oh it sounds like uh, it, this was new before the second world war they didn't do this uh, and some of the commentators said this is very un-british this is very hysterical sounds like a nazi nuremberg, nuremberg rally to me uh, this is this was some of the comments made at the time uh, but later it became something uh, quite acceptable where uh, the people who criticized it were really people very much on the left and a whole mass of middle england considered it to be uh, harmless fun at best uh, 1947 now 1947 was a tremendously important moment for the british empire because india and pakistan gained their independence and india and pakistan together had as much population as most of the rest of the British Empire, or even perhaps even all the rest of the British Empire put uh, put together. Um, and so this was the beginning of the very slow end, well, quite slow end of the British of the British Empire, certainly when India and Pakistan got their independence across Africa. Uh, there were African uh, people and particular African uh, political activists. Said, but if India can get its independence that huge extremely valuable jewel in the british empire's crown then surely we can do it too um, and the end of the empire of course will be both uh, will will have effects on the bbc uh, and the bbc will both uh, uh, will also accompany this 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 process uh, in 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 a, in a number of different ways uh, 1947 is also the year of the first use of telerecording of an outside broadcast for so the first time they could film uh, a uh, for the television they could film uh, a ceremony 
and then show it on the television later on. That is, the technology had increased sufficiently. Uh, this was the service of remembrance from the Cenotaph, the uh, the War Monument in London, uh, which was televised. Uh, uh, it was televised live, but it was also there was a recording shown that evening. And the other um, television event of. Uh, 1947 was the wedding of Princess Elizabeth and Philip Mountbatten, that is the Princess Elizabeth, who would later be Queen Elizabeth II, and indeed still is, as, as far as I know. Uh, this was watched by an estimated 400,000 viewers. Now, it has to be said that a lot of those were uh, watching on somebody else's television, either in a church hall or, or just going round to the neighbours to watch their television was something very common uh, in the in the 40s and 50s, uh, both because there was a different view of what you do at your neighbours um, and also because it was not uh, uh, expected that everybody would have uh, a television. Uh, 1948, uh, we'll see another uh, another tremendous uh, uh, event uh, for broadcasting, and this is the the London uh, Olympic Games, uh, the London Olympic Games of 1948, uh, and of course the Olympic Games came back to London in two, in 2012. 1948, also a tremendously important moment in the history uh, of uh, British social services and the welfare state, the founding of the National Health Service, uh, something which is extremely important to British people and which British people are very proud of uh, all health care was and still is except for dental uh, treatment um, free at the point of use that is to say that you are not refunded the money you pay you just don't pay uh, and this principle has on the whole been kept up till the present day that even the most neoliberal of governments have never dared say you must pay 10 pounds every time you go to the doctor's it was never uh, possible for, for it to do. So in 1948, then Britain gradually uh, recovering from the war, uh, rebuilding London. A quarter of lo London buildings were damaged by, the, by bombs, uh, 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 welcoming many, many workers from um, India and Pakistan and the West Indies to, to help with that. But still, still at the time, still a very different, uh, uh, a very different society from today. 1948, a quarter of British homes have no electricity. Most people live in the same town all their lives, have rather big families, still very often more than three children. Uh, a third of the British population went to the cinema every week. And in the whole country in 1948, there were only 14,500 television sets. And of course, only one channel, the BBC. Uh, there were also just over a million cars on Britain's roads in 1948. So that's just to give you an idea of where uh, society uh, was at at that time. As 1949 uh, comes into uh, into vision, uh, the founding of NATO and the uh, the crystallising of the Cold War, which was going to continue for some, for some time uh, and uh, and um, structure uh, Britain's foreign policy and indeed everybody else's foreign policy. I just want to mention one uh, program from this time. For 25 years, uh, the BBC uh, radio uh, produced a um, program in German um, called Briefe ohne Unterschrift, uh, unsigned letters. And these were letters written to the BBC from citizens of East Germany um, who were uh, and these letters were were read out uh, and uh, commented uh, on the BBC in German. Uh, now, since tuning into the BBC was ideologically unacceptable in East Germany, in, uh, in East Germany under in Stalinist East Germany, uh, letter writers were instructed not to sign their letters. And each Friday, the program makers would announce a different address in West Berlin where letters could be sent. So this is perhaps an, uh, uh, an example, like an important example of how uh, a radio program can be a political weapon, um, both for East Germans who want to criticise their own uh, their their own regime, and also for um, the Western powers who want to uh, emphasise the advantages of their society, and and in particular. Uh, the advantages of uh, democratic, relatively democratic uh, expression. So that was called, that was the, the BBC radio programme in German, Briefe ohne Unterschrift, uh, from 1949 
until 1974. Uh, so, so, so it's very interesting. And we're going to see a whole series of programmes, radio and television programmes, which last a long time. There are quite a number of BBC programmes that last 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Um, and this is perhaps something which would, uh, which is easier to maintain on a publicly owned uh, 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 corporation, in a co publicly owned corporation, than in a, co in a commercial one. Uh, but it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. And I'm going to spend a bit of time on the programmes because although the uh, politics and the social origins of the uh, director generals and the political debates of the commission's inquiries and the priorities of the conservative or labor governments are very important nevertheless what comes down to people when they're in front of their television or uh, uh, when they have their, ra their radio in their lorry, uh, is the programmes, and indeed uh, I've already quoted uh, uh, one uh, leading BBC producer who said, the BBC is the sum of its programmes, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, and so although the programmes can be quite hard to uh, analyze or, in the, or or to 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 summarize uh, in 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 a, a small number of sentences uh, nevertheless i want to look at them and see what we can do with them remembering that the bbc does not directly produce them in the sense that the the, the bbc director general it is extremely rare which is almost unheard of that the bbc director set general says oh i'd like us to have a comedy program about this <coughs> is absolutely not the role of the BBC leadership. The BBC leadership sets up a structure which allows, or does not allow, certain political or literary or creative or playful or educational uh, programme teams, radio or television, to propose and get it accepted and then produce the programmes. So it's certain that there are, there are no doubt many kinds of programmes which are never shown on the BBC because it's the sort of programme that the BBC management would not like. Uh, but nevertheless, all the all of the uh, impetus comes from the comes from the uh, the what's the word from the from the creative te the cre creative teams. So we're still in, we're still in 1949, and we have this uh, uh, on the television. We have the launch. Yes, so we're still on television in this period when there's only one um, when there's only one channel, uh, and uh, we have the launch of one of these extremely long-lasting uh, uh, television programs, Come Dancing, uh, and you can see there uh, it was uh, on television from 1949 until 1998 which is quite a long time. This is a dancing competition. Now, that's what they used to call dancing and what we would now call ballroom dancing uh, with teams, as you can see on the picture there, you have the, the West Midlands from the Casino Birmingham. So you, you have teams from different towns around the country. Uh, and although ballroom dancing in its origins at the in the 19th century was very was rather elite and bourgeois, uh, it's become much more popular. And the dance halls uh, in the 20s, 30s and 40s were huge. I mean, my parents, working class people, they used to go uh, dancing four nights a week um, so it was a huge thing and, and people spent a huge amount of time uh, learning to dance and they could put the radio programs on there were some radio programs about dancing a radio program about dancing might seem strange but th that's all they had and and inside the radio times there were the diagrams to say how to dance this kind of dance uh, so come dancing then this uh, popular uh, dancing competition with teams from different places around the world and it will be extremely successful for almost 50 years until 1998, that is to say, long after dance halls were replaced by discotheques and other venues, although I think it's probably fair to uh, speculate or to guess that the age of the audience of come dancing rose uh, as the years went by, and by the uh, by the 1980s, 1970s, 1980s, it was no longer the uh, the younger uh, elements who who were watching it. Uh, interesting, fascinatingly, the the format was revived in 2004 and is still tremendously popular today, but it, with a huge difference. Instead of teams from around the country, uh, the version today we're calling um, um, strictly come dancing um, is. Um, dancing with celebrities so in fact what you have is professional dancers who each have a partner of somebody who is well known but is not a dancer you know, a, a news reader or an actor or a sportsman or a, uh, and sometimes rather un a member of parliament or and sometimes rather unlikely people so it's interesting that, that in the 21st century it was considered that people would prefer to watch celebrities 
trying to dance well rather than ordinary people trying to dance well in the context of ballroom dancing now there's probably some very deep um, uh, sociological or ph philosophical or zeitgeist conclusion to be made from this but i i don't have it to i don't have it right to to hand here so one of these programs which lasted such a tremendously long time as we move into the 1950s and the uh, relative prosperity uh, is uh, becoming very visible even though rationing will continue for seven years after the war, because, of course, when the war finishes, you don't suddenly have enough meat and enough clothes uh, and enough sugar for everybody. It takes years to rebuild uh, pr uh, pr pr uh, production. By the 50s, really, to everybody's surprise, um, thing, things uh, the, the economy seems to be going very well. On the technical side, in 1950, on the 27th of August, you had the first live television from the European continent, that is, you know, from... Uh, from outside Britain. So live television transmitted internationally. This is again another uh, technological advance. And the, the whole history of the BBC is a history of technological advances. Uh, and sometimes we're not sure what the effect will be until they actually happen. In 1951, the Conservative election won. Uh, the, sorry, the Conservative Party won the election and Winston Churchill became Prime Minister again. However, much of his politics had had to change. In 1945, he was against the National Health Service. He was against nationalisation and he was against many aspects of the welfare state. These policies, however, were so overwhelmingly popular that by 1951, he accepted that these decisions should not be reversed, although the Conservative manifesto said, we shall stop all further nationalisation. It's interesting, they didn't have the confidence to say, we will privatise what has been nationalised. That would happen many, many years later. Um, so, he, uh, Winston Churchill was returned to office, but surrounded by a new team of ministers who understood that the welfare state was here to stay. The rules of the game had changed. It was no longer possible to win elections by being against the welfare state. Uh, and on the 1st of January uh, uh, was a, uh, the first, sorry, the, we're, we're in, yeah, in 1951, on the 1st of January, the first episode of a tremendously popular soap opera. Uh, the Archers. This is a radio soap opera, uh, and so far it has run from 1951 to 2021 without stopping, and there have been 19,345 episodes. It is the longest soap opera in the world. Uh, you can see there some of the cast at the time. Uh, and The Archers uh, presents life in a village in Britain. In fact, it was, a, it was a, originally presented, I think, as a, an everyday story of country folk. I, I'm not sure, if that, I don't, don't remember if that's the exact words. Um, uh, uh, and it really built up the tradition of the soap opera, the long-term soap opera, uh, in its British form. And in its British form means that in general, an interest in ordinary people. This is an ordinary village. Yeah, the, there are no, uh, the, the, it's not restricted to people from the elite. It, this is not Dallas. Uh, and uh, it does a few things. First of all, sometimes the archers, like other British soap operas, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen in other countries, but I don't know about them, um, will tackle social debates. We'll look at questions like racism, snobbery, class distinction, fox hunting, the debate around fox hunting, uh, the archers will reflect uh, uh, changing social, social attitudes and explore sometimes rather difficult questions. And this is uh, uh, something that uh, I think it's important to remember about uh, uh, popular culture, that very often it's a matter of exploring questions which people find worrying. Uh, it's not that common that a, a popular television series or radio series presents an imp and a structured opinion about this question or that question. That's not the role of fictional um, popular series. It's more to look around questions which are worrying because people are already worried about, uh, 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 about them. And there's something useful for people in seeing different sides of this question and different emotions and, and, and different experiences around this question. I will come back to this when we look at television uh, soap operas. The other thing is that the, the soap opera produces a very particular relationship between the programme uh, and its listeners or indeed its viewers. 
Uh, and people really began to treat the people in the arches as if they were neighbours, as if they were friends. Uh, and people would be hoping that, you know, that so-and-so manages to marry so-and-so or so-and-so gets out of their difficult financial situation. Uh, and indeed, this structure, which is even stronger for television, uh, where um, the viewer imagines themselves as friends uh, of the television characters, is something very, very fascinating about uh, soap operas, uh, especially soap operas because it, it's a, it's a long-term uh, re uh, relationship. And so the, you know, the, the archers are tremendously uh, long one. This is also the year when television is slowly uh, expanding across the country. When the television programmes began again after the war, it was still mostly London and a few more places where you could, you could get television. It's only in October, then October 1951. So six years after the war, that television is extends to the north of England. So notice, yeah, that for the whole period uh, before this, uh, in the north, when you talk about the BBC, you're just talking about the radio and, 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 and nothing else. Uh, BBC te uh, television uh, produced uh, uh, a huge number of uh, entertainment programmes, uh, uh, sometimes inventing new formats, sometimes borrowing formats from the United States. Uh, and What's My Line is a quiz programme, which uh, the, the uh, format of which was, was uh, based on the United States um, program of the same name. Uh, very interesting phenomenon because uh, if you look at quiz shows and things like that, whether it's in France or in Britain, you find that people really want to see local versions. Uh, it seems to be almost impossible to sell an American quiz series to people in Britain. People in Britain do not want to watch Americans answering quiz questions even though it's the same language. Uh, and in the same way, people in France, when they're looking at uh, quiz programmes, they don't want American people answering questions and subtitles or, 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 or dubbing. There's something very national uh, about certain kinds of popular, um, popular show. Uh, and in this particular case, what's my line? Let's say, what's my job? Uh, and this is a, a panel game uh, where somebody walks in uh, and they have a particular job and the members of the panel have to guess what the job is by asking questions, if I remember correctly, to which the uh, guest can only answer yes or no. So it's a form of 20 questions, if you like. Why do people like this kind of the, 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 this this kind of program? I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's an inter it's an interesting question. You can see uh, by how the people are dressed that there's still very much a an atmosphere of uh, gentil uh, gentility or even bourgeois society. You look at the necklaces and the earrings and the bow ties. The bow tie in in Britain is even more um, bourgeois uh, than in than in some some uh, uh, other countries. So very much. Uh, although this is for mass consumption, it's presented as we are inviting you ordinary people into this bourgeois place uh, where where you can uh, where where you can uh, you you can uh, enjoy uh, en enjoy yourself. Um, well, I think that there, there may be more videos than I thought there were going to be because I, I'm advancing rather slowly, but I think it would be a mistake to accelerate. It'd be better just to make more, more videos. I, I have time. I'm not allowed out. The nightclubs are closed. So that's all for today. I like to keep them around 35 minutes or so, uh, and there will be another one soon uh, when, I, when I will be continuing with then um, the, uh, what's the word? I will be t continuing with the BBC 1945 to 95. Just click on this button. Mettre fin à la réunion pour